Well, good morning and welcome to our Recycling in Westminster Know the Rules webinar, hosted in partnership with Veolia and Westminster City Council. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning as we delve into the government's latest schemes to reduce waste reduction and pollution and guidance on implementing the legislation within your West End businesses. In the January of this year, the Department for Environment, Food, Rural Affairs, Sorry, Rural Affairs announced it would introduce a ban on certain single use plastic items in England from October, which is clearly just around the corner. This means that businesses must not supply, sell or offer plastic items that are meant for only single use plastic purposes. The ban includes items such as plastic plates, bowls, trays and cutlery and polystyrene food and drink containers. And this will apply to retailers, food vendors, and hospitality businesses. Alongside this, you may have heard that the government will be introducing the Extended Producer Responsibility EPR scheme over the next few years, which will require producers to pay the cost of managing packaging waste. The idea is that if businesses produce polluting mater materials, then they should pay for the cost of the impact it can and will have on the environment as well as on people's health. As representatives for businesses in the West End, we felt it imperative to host this information sharing webinar to provide you and your businesses with a clear understanding of how you'll be affected by the new policies once they come into place, as we expect many of our members in the West End to be impacted, especially by the EPR scheme. We will also be providing tangible actions that you will need to take to comply and best practices case studies from our members who are already delivering solutions to reducing their waste impact. But just before we move on, I'm sure you will agree that sustainability must be at the heart of everything we do. At New West End Company, we believe in the power of partnership and collaboration, and we want to be the driving force in the creation of a West End community that delivers equally for visitors, residents and local workers all whilst reducing the environmental impact on our services, member businesses and visitors. So to further demonstrate our commitment to delivering a sustainable district, in July we enhanced our dedicated resource and welcomed our new Head of Sustainability, Dane Robinson, to the team. Dane joins us with a background in sustainability consulting, having worked at leading consulting firms in addition to the University of Westminster. As such, she brings with her a wealth of experience in the sustainability space, as well as a deep understanding of the West End. And I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Dane to you all today. Morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Dane, the new head of sustainability, and thank you, Dee, for the introduction. It's really great to be at the um, at New West End Company now with so much commitment to sustainability, both from an environmental and social side. Um, from all of the members that I've been able to meet so far, it's been really brilliant to hear the level of passion and commitment and the level of responsibility that everyone is willing to take. So it's been a really wonderful couple of months already and really excited to be working with all of you and hopefully supporting you on your waste and recycling journey as well. I'll pass on to you now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dane. So now I'd like to introduce you to our wonderful panel of experts who will be exploring the new legislation and how businesses be, will be affected by it and providing tangible actions that you can take within your businesses to comply to reduce your waste impact. Firstly, Jack Barkley, Senior Policy Advisor, Consistent Collections at the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, otherwise known as DEFRA, will give an overview of the government schemes to reduce waste production and pollution and discuss how businesses will be affected by the new schemes coming into place. Jack will also discuss general business recycling best practice. Then we will hear from James Mason, Sustainable Development Manager, Westminster at Veolia, which is Westminster's waste management provider, and he will explore the tangible actions that businesses can comply with the government's latest schemes and offer advice on how businesses can start their waste reduction and recycling journey. Finally, the last but not least, Eve Bella, Sustainability Manager at Grosvenor Property UK, will provide some valuable insight into the innovative solutions that Grosvenor Property has already been delivering to reduce their waste impact. We will also have ample opportunity for a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please do submit any questions you may have for our panel in the chat window. So now I will start our panel by handing over to Jack. 
Thank you very much, Dee, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, really happy to be speaking to you all today. Um, I'm going to cover uh, some kind of fundamentals around our simpler recycling reforms. You may previously have heard of these as consistent collections or consistency. Um, in effect, it's the same thing, uh, and I'll go into a little bit of detail around that. Next slide, please. OK, so what is simpler recycling? So in effect, uh, simpler recycling is about driving up the municipal recycling rate across England. The government set a target back in 2018 in its resource and waste strategy to increase the recycling rate to 65% by 2035. Now we're currently at around 44%, uh, so there's some way to go. And the simpler recycling reforms, along, along with the extended producer responsibility for packaging reforms, and along with the deposit return scheme reforms, are designed to drive up this recycling rate to ensure that we're doing the best thing we poss possibly can as far as recycling is concerned. However, there's some added benefits towards uh, creating a more consistent and effective recycling service across the country. We're looking to tackle confusion. Uh, many of you will know that you know, across your businesses or across, or across the country, yeah, different uh, councils will provide different services. Uh, there'll be different uh, materials that are allowed to be recycled in your area. We're looking to tackle this confusion and create a more consistent approach across England. This will hopefully make recycling much easier for people, both in the workplace and at home. There's some background consultations that have gone on around this. So back in 2019, we consulted on the consistent collection reforms and uh, we put into primary legislation uh, the requirements for separate collection. I'll come on to this shortly. And in 2021, we went into it, we dug into a little bit more detail as to what these require, requirements would mean for households and businesses in England. And we consulted on a variety of things uh, such as the commencement date, so when these requirements would come into effect, uh, possible exemptions, uh, both for mixing dry recyclable materials and also exemptions for micro firms. Um, and we are poised to release a government response to this 2021 consultation, which will provide clarity to households, businesses, um, waste collectors, local authorities as to what these requirements will mean. So uh, please don't hold me to account for being uh, deliberately ev evasive. I am. Uh, I will be providing you as much detail as I possibly can at this stage. But what I will welcome you to look out for um, key government documents that will be published soon, which will provide uh, any clarity, which I'm unable to do today. Next slide, please. OK, so what is this fundamentally? So uh, we are looking to at its core with simpler recycling, we are looking to separate recyclable waste streams from the residual waste stream. It's worth saying at this point that many of you will already be in a position as businesses uh, where you are recycling uh, uh, some of these waste streams or all of them. Um, and you know, we look to you as uh, providing best practice across uh, the industry. But a lot of businesses aren't in the same position. A lot of businesses uh, don't necessarily have recyclable services in place um, across England. So we're looking to provide clarity and consistency in this area and ensure that the requirements are the same for all businesses in England. So at its core, uh, the uh, primary goal of Simply Recycling is to remove food waste from the residual waste stream. So that means that you'll need a separate food waste container and that's true whether or not you are a uh, uh, business in the hospitality sector where you might be generating you know, many tonnes of food waste or whether you're a small retail unit uh, producing a small amount of uh, food waste from employee lunches or something equivalent. Uh, now, obviously, you will want to make your arrangements with your waste collector um, in line with the amount of food waste you generate. There will be no requirement for weekly collections of food waste. Uh, there is a requirement on households to have weekly food waste collections. 
but that's not true in the business sector because we recognize the need for flexibility depending on the amount of food waste generated. Then separately, you'll be required to uh, arrange for the collection of dry recyclable materials. So these are metal, plastic, glass, paper and card. Now in the primary legislation, we've set out that these must be recycled separately from one another. So that you would need different containers to collect each of these individual uh, waste streams. However, uh, along with our government response, we will be uh, publishing a statutory guidance consultation. And in this consultation, we will be asking for stakeholders to provide us with feedback on proposals around exempting the uh, separate collection of some of these materials. I'll try and explain that a little bit more clearly. So basically, we will be uh, proposing that some of these materials uh, might be more effectively collected uh, mixed together. And we'll be uh, asking that question in the statutory guidance consultation and uh, we'll be looking for responses, um, you know, some of the challenges around uh, collecting these separately, um, some of the reasons why it might be more effective to uh, uh, mix these together for collection. But at its core, this is about removing recyclable waste streams away from the residual waste stream. Next slide. So who's in scope? So basically everyone, um, households are in scope, but as I mentioned, there's some slight differences to the requirements. Uh, there'll be a requirement for a collection of food waste weekly and also garden waste. This won't apply for businesses. So we use the term non-household municipal premises. This refers to businesses, so most businesses across hospitality, retail and wholesale, uh, businesses in the education and health sectors, uh, in the transport sector and offices and various other services. But we've also, uh, we also include non-domestic premises and it may be that some of you belong to that group. Uh, so that's schools or universities, hospitals, nursing homes and residential homes such as hostels. In our statutory guidance consultation, we will also be asking or proposing uh, the inclusion of uh, some other non-domestic premises. So that will be penal institutes, uh, that will be uh, places of worship, charity shops. So if you do belong to any of those groups, uh, which some of you may you know, look out for the statutory guidance consultation, it's a good opportunity for you to provide your feedback. Next slide. So it's worth mentioning at this point that for the purposes of these reforms, we've classified businesses into different size groups. Uh, the key one for this is uh, micro firms. So a micro firm, as per our classification, is a business or entity that's employing uh, fewer than 10 members of staff at full time equivalent. So in our consultation, we proposed uh, or we asked, consulted on uh, two different types of exemption. The first was a permanent exemption, which would mean that no micro firm would have to uh, uh, um, meet the new requirements. The second was a temporary two year exemption where micro firms would be given a little bit more time to uh, adapt to uh, the new requirements. Um, this would help us provide greater deal of support because we recognise that micro firms may face some financial or some uh, technical barriers uh, to their transition. Now, unfortunately, I can't be clear on what the government uh, decision is yet. That will all be made clear in the government response, which is poised to be published soon. Um, however, uh, the uh, definition of micro firms, sh I, I should mention, will apply to uh, all of your business operations. So if you have two separate units which uh, uh, have eight members of staff in each unit, that will be 16 FTE. And so you would therefore be classified as a small business and you wouldn't benefit from any exemption which is given. 
Now, all of this will be set out clear, more clearly in the government response. So I urge you to look out for that when it is published. Next slide. Uh, so again, not trying to be evasive, uh, just providing you as much detail as I can at this point. Uh, the commencement dates for uh, businesses and non-domestic premises will be announced in the government response. Um, and this will include any details of the exemptions for micro firms. What I would say is that once these commencement dates are announced, uh, that should provide the certainty of a clear direction of travel. Um, and, you know, those are the dates by which you must be compliant with your business. However, we'd encourage all organisations or businesses to begin preparations in advance of the requirement. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, this is about transitioning away from uh, putting recyclable waste streams, uh, take, you know, sending recyclable waste streams to landfill. And we're looking to improve uh, the recycling rate across the country and uh, business collections are a big part of that. Next slide. So as I've alluded to throughout the presentation, um, uh, you know, we urge you to look out for the consistency government response and we'll be engaging with partners uh, you know, across the business sector to ensure that um, these documents are, uh, are um, disseminated across uh, different membership groups. Um, that includes the New West End Company. Uh, and then we also urge you to look out for the stat guidance consultation. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to provide feedback on um, some of those proposals um, that I've mentioned uh, in the presentation. However, probably more crucially, uh, once these uh, responses and consultations are published, uh, DEFRA will be in a much better position to engage with stakeholders um, in, uh, you know, in a much more kind of personal way. Uh, we'll be able to engage on uh, the various barriers and challenges that you face. And we'll be looking to build in support um, uh, support systems which will help businesses to transition to the new requirements. So we're currently working with our charity partner, RAP, uh, to uh, develop a business of recycling website, which will host a uh, you know, wide breadth of resources which will support businesses to transition in the most effective way possibly. And I think that should be it. Um, I've got time for questions or uh, we can do questions at the end, I think. Is that right? And I'll pass over to James now. Thank you very much, Jack. That was really informative. Um, as Dee mentioned, my name is James Mason and I'm the Sustainable Development Manager at Veolia and Westminster Council's Commercial Waste Services. So we carry out the recycling and waste services for business in Westminster and also businesses in the NWEC area. But there's much more than that. And my key role is to work alongside businesses in Westminster to help them reduce their waste, reduce their carbon emissions and achieve their sustainability goals really. At Westminster, we have an emissions target for the city to reach net zero by 2040 and to become a net zero council by 2030. So you can see it's a huge element on our agenda. And I mean, if you ask me, it's the key element. Um, this morning, I'm going to give you a quick overview of sustainability in Westminster. I'm going to focus on the wider issues and the wider implications and give you some simple actions that you can take away moving forward, building on what Jack was talking about just there. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Izzy. We're first going to look at sustainability and the circular economy. You can pop onto the next one again, please. Thank you. I'm going to take it all the way back just very briefly and look at what sustainability actually means. Apologies if you're very well versed on this already, it's important to look at the framework. Uh, so sustainability means meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So essentially it's living within our means. Now for something to be sustainable, it must be made up of these three pillars. Dane touched on this a little bit earlier. So what that means is that something must be socially responsible, must be economically viable, and it must be environmentally beneficial. And if it doesn't meet even just one of these pillars, then we can't truly consider something sustainable. It's these three pillars coming together, how you create that real 
genuine long term change and that that lasting value. And this is not just for environmental sustainability. It comes into, for example, the way that your business might run. If you can go to the next slide, please, Izzy. Thank you. So if sustainability is something that we're trying to achieve, then the circular economy is an integral process and an integral part with which we do so, with which we achieve that sustainability. And it's something that we at Westminster Council and Veolia are always trying to put in place with every operation that we run, with every decision that we're making, we're taking the circular economy into account. So to understand circular economy, if we have a look first, at the more common or historically the more common linear economy that's on the top right of your screen there. So in a linear economy model, we see a product say, for example, if we take a plastic bottle is produced, it's sold, it's used only once here and it's disposed of. So all of those um, resources, all of the energy that's gone into pr the production and use of that plastic bottle uh, uh, are put out in just one use. Whereas on the other hand, with the circular economy model, we follow a production and manufacture, selling, use, the same start, or similar start to a linear economy. But here we're seeing reuse, we're seeing refurbishment, repair, a recycle model. So we're seeing the waste product of one item become part of the manufacture of another item. This way we're keeping materials within the system and we don't have to take up the planet's raw resources for, for everything that we need. And the general principles here are about using all of our resources in an efficient way, to, to put it simply. But what this includes is those material resources. So if we take our plastic bottle, for example, but it also includes the likes of energy and fuel as well. And, and of course, these are really key elements of climate impact. And it's about keeping those materials and products in use for longer. And thinking further than recycling only. Recycling is a key part of the circular economy, but it's thinking further than that. Think about how we can minimise the carbon emissions from all of these processes that we run as individuals and that we run as organisations and retaining the most value from those resources. And we've got the aim here, of course, of, of um, carbon reduction, resource security improvements, reducing the impacts on nature, all of those, those um, key benefits that come with it. Thanks, Izzy. You can pop on to the next slide. So how do we implement it? In this next section, we're going to chat a little bit about what we can do as organisations to implement a circular economy within our own operations. All of this will contribute towards ensuring your business is on top of the legislation, the regulation that is coming up in future. Next slide, please, Izzy. Thank you. Please do uh, excuse the light bulb here. You'll be happy to hear that I haven't gone for the cheesy angle and chosen a light bulb to signify big ideas and bright ideas. I will be doing that in a moment, but that's not why I've got that on the screen. I just want to start with a couple of concrete examples of how we as an organisation, my organisation, have implemented measures that have contributed towards that circular economy and, and allowed us to reduce our emissions. So I've got here a really small, a really simple of exa uh, example of a change that any business can make. And I'm sure there's many businesses on this call here who have made this already. And so we implemented LED lights. So this is nothing groundbreaking. It's something that you will have all, I'm sure, heard of before. But what I really want to focus on here is that making changes doesn't have to be difficult. You don't have to turn your whole operation, your whole organization on its head to start that journey. So if we look at lighting, for example, that accounts for nearly 5% of global carbon emissions. And according to the climate group, a global switch to energy efficient lighting could save over 1.4 billion with a B tons of carbon emissions. So you can see those small changes and, and how they can, they can make a real difference um, globally. And if you could pop to the next slide, please, Izzy. So from the small to the slightly larger that, that, that we're putting in place here. So this year we launched our circular closed loop solution to charge our electric vehicles and to charge them from the electricity generated by the city council's general waste. So this is an example of us on, on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, so what this means is basically all the general waste, all the non-recyclable waste that we collect within Westminster is sent for energy recovery. We're really proud to say we don't send anything at all to landfill um, at Westminster Council. And this energy recovery process produces heating for the national grid, and it also produces electricity. All of this is done directly from that general waste. Now, as of this year, we have a wire now connecting from that facility directly across the road to our fully electric depot. And this wire sends electricity produced by our waste 
to charge our electric vehicles. These electric vehicles can then go back around into the city, collecting that general waste, which in turn will produce that electricity once again. So it really brings around a, a truly circular solution with, with Westminster's waste. So to give you a couple of examples, probably on the too far end of the spectrum, but if you could go to the next slide, please, Izzy, we're going to look a little bit about how you as a business can implement a circular economy and, and how you as a business can, can um, move into ensuring that you're staying up to date with these regulations and, and also impacting your carbon emissions. There's a huge amount out here that, that can be done, but just to take you through a couple of examples. The first thing I would recommend for Westminster businesses is to sign up to uh, Westminster Council's Sustainable City Charter. It's a business pledge to reduce your carbon footprint. Signatories receive um, free resources, tools, guides, help, assistance to, to take you through your, your net zero journey, as well as access to events and workshops and tools to take you a little bit deeper into it there as well. Uh, if you are an SME, the climate team at the council have partnered with Climate Essentials, so they can then provide you with even further tools and support on your journey to net zero. So they've got a, a really effective data dashboard there and they can work alongside you on your carbon emissions. But let's take a look at what you might be able to do implementing and, and changing some of the operations and give you a couple of examples. So food and beverage, if you're a food and beverage organization, food redistrib redistribution is really key at the moment. Uh, redistributing your surplus edible food to people who might need it. So Felix Project is an, is an example here of, of some fantastic work um, that organisations are carrying out, delivering surplus food to those who need it most. You can see here where the social element is coming into that sustainability um, uh, and, and we're building those three pillars. Something else that you can look at, single use reduction. I know this was touched on by Jack briefly there, um, but there is of course legislation coming into play here um, as Dee mentioned and that will require some changes to the way that we're consuming in this regard. But we are seeing a lot of organisations offer the likes of reusable cup incentives and, and they's, they've been incredibly popular. I'm sure you can all think of a particular cafe in your local area who offers this and it's something that will make you a little bit more memorable as well, uh, as well as making an impact on, on um, your production. Looking at retail return schemes are a really, really interesting initiative promoting that circular economy. Timberland actually have a take back program. So it's allowing any customers to take back any products to a store and they'll uh, repair these, refurbish these, upcycle, recycle these. Um, really fantastic options there. Textiles recycling, um, it's not included necessarily in the uh, segregation, but it's a really easy implementation. We're seeing a lot of retailers offer textiles return schemes for customers to come in, drop off their old textiles, even then with an incentive for customers, maybe a voucher or something to, to spend at the store. What I will say here is if you do want these textiles to be collected, if you're not sure what to do with them, if you want to implement this, give me a call. We can organize that for you, not a problem. We can make sure we um, uh, we sustainably dispose of those for you. Uh, rental is another really interesting area. So Selfridges actually right here in the NWEC area have Selfridges rental. I really, really love this one. So they've got clothes that are available to rent for four, eight days, a month or so, and after which they can be returned. This is a, a fantastic way to pr promote reuse um, and also allowing for, for certain clothes and clothing lines to become that much more accessible. Um, Liberty, who are also in the NREC area, started to use paper bubble wrap. So reducing the amount of plastic they're using in their packaging. It's a really, really simple swap, a really impactful swap that, that you can make uh, looking at your procurement. And then one last one I want to touch on here is, is regeneration. This is becoming uh, more and more of a term that's used when we talk about the circular economy and when we talk about changing our operations. And in this sense, it really refers to the greening of your business and, and the greening of your area. In the middle of London, of course, this is of even further importance in our concrete jungle in which we live. But we're currently working with a number of organisations in Westminster. So we're looking to integrate the likes of urban farming, vertical farming, space and energy efficient food systems and the likes. And there's some really, really interesting oper um, opportunities here to work alongside these these really fantastic organisations. And then, of course, you do have recycling. I've got recycling right at the bottom there, and that's yeah, I've done that on purpose because for me, only after we've exhausted all of these other options should we look at recycling. 
but of course maximizing your recycling as a business is is key um in in reducing your your carbon emissions it, it, it is the last resource but it is what we should be looking at at the same time and making sure as jack mentioned we are uh, separating out those key materials so that they can be recycled and if we could pop over to the next slide please izzy thank you so we're going to very briefly touch on the recycling legislation we have Jack from DEFRA here is um, the, the best source of information and I'm just going to add a little bit to, to what he's gone over. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, the top two here, uh, as Jack mentioned, we won't go into too much detail uh, about today as a lot of that key consultation is, is still taking place, but please do keep a lookout for any information from uh, ourselves at the Council and Veolia from DEFRA and from NWEC as when we know more and, and, and when there, there are further decisions and actions moving forward, this will be communicated to, to businesses um, and we'll make sure that you have all of that information that you do need. Um, the separate recycling separation, again, I won't go into too much detail, but it's about looking at separating your glass, your metals, your paper, um, your plastics from that general waste to make sure that it's recycled. So um, failure to do so could result in your organization being fine. So it's, it's a really simple change here that you can make to, to make sure adhering to the regulation is, is recycling properly. So ensuring you are separating out those, those key materials. And then finally, just to touch on a couple of um, Westminster specific considerations. The key here that I want to really touch on is, is adhering to the time bands that are set out by, by the council. You can find these, I've got a link on the next slide um, where you'll be able to get more information on it. So each street has its own time bands. Each street has got its own specific times of the day where you can place your bags out. Whoever your waste collector is, um, doesn't matter who it is, you need to stick to these time bands if you use a bag service. It's, that's a really important one to know. Again, not doing so could leave you open to fines. But also, I mean, the key here for me is that it makes your area a lot less pleasant for yourselves, your, your teams who work in the area, for visitors. And, you know, if you've got that presence of waste on the street for a long time, it's, it's really not not a nice place to be. Um, I think we've all all past areas where we've got bags piled up. It's really important to make sure that we are looking at adhering to those time bands. Thanks, Izzy. Uh, and these are just a couple of links to find out more. So there's the Sustainable City Charter on the right hand side. Um, and then our website is cleanstreets.westminster.gov.uk for, for any other further resources or assistance. Um, and you can move on to the next one. Thanks, Izzy. So if you do need any further help, any further advice, information, if you want to set up recycling, if you want to expand your recycling, if you want to get more information on how you can start your sustainability, sustainability journey, whatever it might be, please do get in contact. I would also like to say here we have a tour date booked for all new West End Company members to come and see our recycling facility, which is um, just a few miles away down in, in South London, and that's taking place on the 22nd of November. So if you'd like to come down, see what happens to Westminster's recycling, learn a little bit more about the recycling processes, about this legislation and around sustainability on the whole, then please do get in contact with, with the NWEC team or, or, or myself, and we can organise that for you. Spaces are limited and it will be a first come, first serve basis. Um, uh, of course, so um, I'd really encourage you to come down to that. It's really fantastic to, to see it up close and personal. So thank you very much and uh, I'll hand over to Eve now. Thank you, James, for passing over um, and thank you all for the opportunity to share our ideas and progress with you today. Um, I'm Eve and I'm the Sustainability Manager for Grosvenor Property UK. Um, so Grosvenor is an international property developer, manager and investor with a track record of over 340 years. If we can have the next slide, please. So we aim to take a people and planet positive approach, looking long term so that we can help to create places where businesses, communities and nature thrive, hopefully for the next century as well as this one. Next slide, please. Our sustainability strategy involves both environmental and social impact goals with milestones in 2025, 2030 and 2040. Um, so today I'm going to talk you through our ambitions for our zero waste goal and some examples of how we're delivering on them in practice. Next slide, please. 
Our overarching vision for waste is to adopt circular economy principles, as James has mentioned before, which in practice for us includes finding ways to reduce waste at source, minimising the whole life carbon of our properties and increasing our recycling and reuse rates. This also includes sending zero avoidable va uh, waste to landfill by 2030. So we've split our value chain essentially across four key categories, the places we manage, our developments, our supply chain and our corporate. So below each category just gives you a couple of examples of the types of waste we can improve or influence. Next slide, please. So while our corporate make waste will make up a relatively small proportion of the, the waste across our total value chain, we think it is important for giving us a greater understanding of the challenges around operational waste and through trialling solutions and, get, and engaging with our own staff, um, we hope to be able to apply our learning to the properties we manage and develop. Next slide, please. So currently um, we have a high re reported recycle rate. However, we're very aware that this, this is based solely on the proportion of recycling sacks we purchase relative to the, uh, general waste. Therefore, accounting for contamination of sacks, we are aiming for an actual recycling rate of 50% this year for our corporate facilities. And our key activity ar areas around this are finding ways to reduce our waste volumes, um, collect and use data insights, phasing out single use plastics, as has been mentioned before, um, increasing the recycling behaviours of staff and trying to clear up confusion around what goes where, essentially, increasing the recycling streams that we already collect, reusing materials and finally refurbishing um, more sustainably. Next slide, please. So at the start of the year, we conducted a waste audit with our waste management provider to give us greater insight into the source of contamination and waste streams that we produce as a business. So as we did suspect, this shows that our actual recycle rate was much lower than the reported rate, sitting at just 47%. It was also identified that 16% of general waste could have actually been recycled. And this was telling us that A, we need to increase the recycling streams we collect, and B, we needed to influence the behaviour of our employees. Next slide, please. So to reduce our overall waste volume, we started by simply reducing the number of bins we had on each floor to just two. Um, a key driver in us reducing the amount of packaging we produce is actually having our staff canteen um, serve lunches, hot food and salads, etc. Which, having started that in 2021, um, we've really seen a significant reduction in packaging from shop bought lunches um, from staff going outside for lunch. And we're also in the process of creating a shared inventory of items um, that staff purchase for events or marketing so that we can try and re really re -avoid, um, avoid repurchasing uh, wherever possible and make use of what we already have as a lot of what we bought can be used again um, and actually just need a little bit more creativity to, to find a new use for them. Next slide, please. Although we currently separate food waste, metal, paper, card and plastic from our waste audit, there were several types of waste that were frequent, uh, either contaminating, recycling or in the general waste. And so off the back of that, we've now expanded our collections to include innovative tissue recycling, um, cardboard recycling, coffee cup, so single use coffee cups and coffee grounds. We've also worked with our provider to trial and embed QR coded waste sacks, um, which will start to give us better insight into contamination levels and really understand what is driving um, the contamination as they can scan them at their waste sorting facility, and report that back to us. We've also started converting some of our paper waste back into Grosvenor notebooks. Um, and excitingly, at the back entrance to our office, we set up a TerraCycle recycling point, um, which is for use by both staff and the general public to recycle items that can't be collected in regular streams. 
So example items include Pringles cans, toothpaste tubes, cosmetic containers, bread bags, all sorts of different waste. Um, and I'd really recommend you check out their site as the streams are free to set up and you can act as a drop off point for the general public. So next slide, please. So engaging employees is key to reducing our contamination rates. So to start with, we re reviewed our bin placement and we noticed there was no consistency between each floor. So we made sure that that was the case so people wouldn't have to search for the correct bin. Coupled th with this, we updated the signage to remove confusion about what goes where. And we've also worked with our provider to hold a recycling workshop to upskill staff. And I think importantly, get those questions answered um, because waste management in the office might vary to what they experience at home. And it's just trying to really clear up the confusion around how you've recycled correctly for our provider. And next week, we're actually taking our key stakeholders, including our catering manager, facilities manager to the waste processing facility. So hopefully, again, we can really understand and get under the skin of what goes into that processing after it's left our building to share both internally and create more improvements. Next slide, please. So in terms of phasing out single use plastic, we're really proud that we've removed almost all our single use plastic from our corporate operations, including takeaway cups from our staff cafe, single use coffee and tea sachets and also plastic umbrella bags. That's what the picture is below. That's our new um, plastic free umbrella dryer for rainy days. Um, but we still have some work to do, a couple of items such as replacing plastic hygiene bags and also finding solutions for our kitchen, such as cling film or piping bags. Next slide, please. We've worked with a number of companies to find new homes for our reusable items. Um, and this has included non-food uh, items through Olio, which is a neighbourhood based sharing app and larger office furniture through Reuse and Globe Chain, which are both reuse marketplaces. Um, and we've just completed our second audit last week to understand if these changes have increased our recycling rate. So we're very looking forward to finding out. Next slide, please. I just thought I'd briefly mention our approach to refurbishment. Um, so our office was refurbished over 20 years ago now, so we're planning an update. Um, but since 2019, we've had what we call the Grosvenor Sustainable Development Brief in place, which sets out a framework to achieving lower impact developments. So for this space, we're targeting less than 3.5 tonnes of waste per 100 metre squared, 15% um, reuse on or off site and 85% reused or recycled. And that is excluding waste incineration and also 99.5% non-hazardous waste diverted from landfill. And I thought I'd highlight one solution that's really helping us progress in this area, um, and that's a solution called QFlow. And essentially how it works is it allows on-site staff to take a picture of waste or delivery tickets with their phone, and QFlow's AI can process and upload the information to a database. Um, missing information, for example, the carrier license can be flagged and contractors can go into the database and edit to make sure that we're compliant with the latest waste legislation. So all of this information is then gathered into dashboards where we can monitor in real time the development waste volumes, recycle rate, diversion from landfill, and it will hopefully allow us to be much more reactive to issues compared to annual audits we've done historically and progress to our waste goals at pace. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope some of those ideas are applicable to your businesses as well. Um, and I believe we're now opening up for Q&A. Thank you so much to actually uh, all three of our speakers. I'm not sure if I should admit this, but I've just learned so much in the last 45 minutes or so. So thank you. Um, we do have uh, lots of questions, actually. So we'll kick off. Some of them, I think, may have been answered as we've gone through. But um, just as a reminder, this is probably um, for Jack, often maybe James. Can you remind us of what the current recycling rates are and what the ambition is to get to uh, here in Westminster? 
Yeah, so I can go on the current recycling rates. It's 44.1%. Uh, but as for Westminster, I don't know. So maybe, James, you might be better placed uh, to answer that question. Uh, certainly centrally, uh, we're looking to reach a 65% municipal recycling rate in England by 2035. Uh, yeah, and just to jump in, so um, the recycling rate for the NWEC members is actually at 50 percent, so it's it's just above the average, which is really fantastic to see. Um, I think that's from seeing businesses as engaged as they are um, in in an area like the West End. Obviously, throughout Westminster, that that number fluctuates and differs depending, um, but we're looking at 50 percent for NWEC. Fantastic. Thank you uh, so much to both of you. Um, James, staying with you, if there's one thing that you'd like our new SN company members to take away today from your presentation, what would that be? I think for me, um, there was so much to take from, from uh, all three presentations. I think for me, the big thing is that we've got a long way to go. We've got a lot to do when, when we talk about um, the circular economy and when we talk about climate change and, and making an impact and there is a huge amount that we have to do moving forward but for me the key here really is that there are tangible steps that we can take and whilst we've got a long journey ahead of us it's it's about taking those small steps and starting to implement those smaller changes that start to add up eve outlined so many amazing things that that, that have been going on and and they're all small things that are adding up to to a larger impact and for me it's it's about looking looking at the small things that you can start to change and and look within your operation at how we can reduce our emissions reduce our impacts in 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 minor ways moving into um, and impacting the, the larger issue. Thank you so much, James. Then staying on a similar theme, actually, uh, for you, Jack, what would be the one request that you would like to make to our property owners and retail occupier members on the call to support with this agenda? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think uh, uh, as far as the new requirements are concerned, the key takeaway is that there are requirements coming forward for you and your businesses to remove recyclable waste streams from residual waste streams. So remove them from your general waste and food waste collections can have a huge impact. Uh, and so I think if you take anything away from today, it's like this is the direction of travel. Um, this is the change that will be required of you uh, in the near future. Um, so I think, you know, starting to look at your current waste uh, management service, starting to look at your current practices in your businesses, keeping in mind that these changes are coming. Thank you so much. Eve, we've got a couple for you here. How were you able to really get the buy in uh, from colleagues and other stakeholders to deliver such innovative solutions that you've got at Grosvenor? Um, thank you. Yes, I think just reflecting on this, one one of our key sort of elements of our sustainability strategy is to have roadmaps for at, at a team level. So for all of the teams across the business and then each item is split out into um, for an individual. And so they the result of that is that we have an individual who's responsible, say, for example, for our corporate recycling rate. And of course, we all support where we can, but there is that sense of ownership. And what we've done is actually linked the completion of our roadmaps with all of our other business KPIs so that it's actually linked to bonus and everyone's really interested in getting our goals across the line. And I think it's that sense of we're all in it together and in order for us to all benefit, we all need to pull our weight, if you like. Absolutely, completely agree. And then again, along a similar theme, what support do you think would be most helpful as a property owner for others in this area uh, and individual businesses to reduce waste production and embed more circular practices? Because it's incredibly difficult despite your innovative you know, solutions that you put into play. 
I think for me, it probably is that point around consistency. Um, so in terms of all of the properties we manage, they may be with multiple different waste management providers. So if we can give guidance that is consistent and what we're saying for one provider is consistent with the other, I think that'd be really, really helpful. Um, and as well as that, just increasing the data and the quality of data that we collect on properties and the waste that they produce to get a real sense of what is the waste volume of, say, for example, an average office building. So we can really start to benchmark and understand and drive performance um, through through data, really. Thank you so much. And then, James, this might be one for you. How can we really encourage both member businesses and colleagues within our businesses to ensure that we're recycling properly to reduce the contamination? It's something we've heard a lot about today, and it's probably something that we have taken for granted, actually, some of this over the years. So how do we really embed that in um, our businesses and with our colleagues? I think for me, it's 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 all about education. Um, that's that's the real key. That's how you can get that long term change in behaviour from uh, your staff within your business, whether that is in an office or, or whether it's in in a kitchen or, or whether it's in a retail store. It's about educating your staff so they understand the implications of it. So not only looking at, OK, what do you have to recycle? You've got to put that plastic bottle into the recycling bin, of course, but to really allow them to understand why it's important so that there's 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 value in, in what they're doing. So I would recommend um, education sessions. We've got actually teams who can provide this. I know Fernando, one of my colleagues, is on the call and, and he's done uh, dozens and dozens in the last few months of training sessions and we've got teams across the, the borough who can provide these uh, for businesses so we can come in and provide you with a, a bespoke education and training sessions for your teams around sustainability and around recycling to make sure we're driving down that contamination and driving up um, that recycling rate. I would also recommend coming down to, to the tour. I really, really mean it when I say that when I've seen individuals come down to the tour and, and they get brought closer to the recycling process. They understand what happens to their recycling. There, there builds that connection between what they do at home or what they do in the business and what happens after it leaves it. So rather than someone just putting something into the bin and thinking, that's it, I'm never going to have to worry about it again. It's almost that disembodied, if you will. Bringing people down to the recycling facility brings them a lot closer to the whole process and, and really engenders more of a care. So I would, I would really recommend coming down to that, inviting your teams down. It is an NWEC, um, a, a, an NWEC member tour, but we can offer these tours for free to anyone. So please do reach out if you want to get your whole team, if you want to get 15 people from your company down, then please do. Um, so I would recommend that as well. Thank you so much, James, and I will be on the tour <laughs> uh, in a Fantastic. couple of weeks time. And I'm delighted to be there. But but actually, I think it's for all of us on the call to be the advocates and to start giving that education and bring in, you know, the experts involved. But I think it's down to all of us really to really push the agenda. Now, I've got a really tricky question, so, and I'm not sure who can answer this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How much energy is used to convert general waste to electricity? And does this cause pollutants in the process? James, it might be for you. That will be one for <laughs> me. Um, so I don't know the exact numbers in regards to how much energy is used. Um, what I can say is that energy recovery is the most environmentally friendly way that we uh, can currently in the UK deal with non-recyclable waste. So that that's exactly why we do it. It's, it's again looking at that circular economy, it's producing something from our waste. Um, so that's why we'll start with. Uh, it, it, at the end of the day, it is the com combustion of of general waste. It, that that's that's just a fact and we're not going to we're not going to hide from that. But there is a, inc an incredibly rigorous flue gas treatment process, so a, a treatment of all of the combustion gases that goes down, uh, goes on at the facility. So that's everything from including it's activated lime and carbon, which 
emits a chemical process which changes um, the chemical makeup of the gases. There's also filters, the biggest filters you've ever seen. You take a coffee filter, this, these filters are, are 10 meters wide to, to trap all of those solids and all of those, those particles. Um, and there's further, there's, there's further treatment process. There's the use of ammonia in water and that kind of thing. I'm sorry, I'm not a scientist. I can't go into too much detail. But what I'm trying to say is there's a, a rigorous treatment process. We are, of course, under so much scrutiny in regards to make uh, legislation and regulation and making sure that we are cleaning those gases. And, and of course, we are always ad adhering to those. We often get in the colder months, calls in from residents around the uh, facilities that they can see um, gas uh, and, and carbon coming out from the, the pipe. But actually, that's only in the colder months. It's just water vapour that comes out. Um, so it, it, there, there is some, um, there is some uh, release of some emissions, but as with every process, there is some emissions. It's about driving those emissions down and understanding how we can uh, we can make it the most sustainable option. Fabulous, thank you so much. And then one last question. Will there be a pack to share with occupiers to start the process? And James, I believe there's we've got lots of material through Veolia and others that we that we can share with our business members um, very soon after this call. Absolutely, there's there's plenty. Thank you so much. Well, it just leaves me to thank our expert panellists. And as you can tell, there's a lot of passion in the room and a lot of information here. So please do feel free to get in contact with New West End if you have any further questions. I could see a couple more flicking in, but we just haven't got time for that today. Thank you all for joining us. And as I say, connect with New West End Company and we'd love to see you on the Veolia tour. Thank you all for joining. <laughs>